Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, greetings from Institute for Sustainable Communities. Uh, we'll wait a bit for uh, a minute or so for everyone to join in, and then we'll start. Okay, I think we'll go ahead. Uh, we are delighted to welcome you for the session on strengthening the decentralized or the distributed renewable energy systems. Uh, we'll call it uh, DRE for, uh, to save time in rural India that we are hosting with the Rockefeller Foundation. We would like to thank the Nudge Foundation and Chase India for supporting us putting up this session. I am Megha Nath. Uh, project officer from the Institute for Sustainable Communities, uh, Energy and Environment Team. While we wait for everyone to settle in, uh, we, we would like to open the session with a poll to familiarize you with the need for DRE systems in India. Um, I have Puran on uh, with me who will uh, handle uh, things back in. Puran, can we have the poll, please? So the question is, what are the key barriers to trans uh, transitioning and transforming towards a green grid in India? Um, I'll give you maybe about uh, two seconds to answer the question. Now you can answer all the questions, like uh, it's a multiple choice question, so you can answer as many as possible. You'll see the polls uh, on the right hand side in the panel. All right, so um, I see that everybody is quite familiar with this topic and uh, it's great that we have an audience who's, uh, who knows uh, quite a bit about this topic. The correct answer are, uh, answers are inadequate and overburdened infrastructure and uh, increasing power demands. Um, so before we go forward, few housekeeping rules. Um, we request all attendees to remain in listen-only mode uh, while we speak. Uh, Today's presentation is being recorded and will be shared with the registered, uh, registered participants. Uh, please use the question tab on the right to type in your comments or questions during the webinar. We will have a Q&A session uh, at the end of the panel discussion. To begin with, uh, I would like to invite <clears throat> Ms. Uh, Dion Ferris, President and CEO of Institute for Sustainable Communities. Dion is an environmental lawyer, racial social justice practitioner, and a systems change thought leader. She began her career at the US EPA, founded the Sustainable Community Development Group, and was the VP for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at the National Audubon, Audubon Society. Sorry. So over to you, Ms. Ferris. Thank you so much, Mega. Greetings, everyone. I'm Dion Ferris, president of the Institute for Sustainable Communities. On behalf of the Institute, I would like to thank the Rockefeller Foundation, the Nudge Foundation, Chase, and all of the partners of this Charcha event for providing such a lively platform to advance these important conversations. I'm thrilled to be invited to open this important conversation today and introduce our esteemed panel of experts. First, let me take a few moments to set the stage for our conversation. At the Institute for Sustainable Communities, our mission is helping local leaders and communities around the world address environmental, economic, and social impacts and building a healthy and peaceful future shaped and shared by all. We're aligned in spirit and in vision with the Charcha ideals, and I'd like to take a moment to talk about our alignment. Over the last 30 years, the Institute has led more than 130 transformative, community-driven, and locally-driven projects in 31 countries. And all of them have helped surface locally relevant and internationally scalable solutions. 
we convene and collaborate with cross-sector interdisciplinary stakeholders whose decisions, budgets, investments, and power affect the environment, community health, and resiliency. We pinpoint the communities, the countries, the governments, the regions, the cities, and major corporate brands that are grappling with the most greenhouse gas and pollution emissions. We prioritize the places and populations where energy efficiency, natural resources conservation, technological and financial interventions will produce the most benefits. Keeping an eye on large scale, meaningful impact, the Institute has worked with local partners, assisting them in many ways. For example, we've helped over 60,000 factories operationalize environmental governance standards. We've supported 150,000 smallholder and women farmers in learning and implementing regenerative agriculture practices. We facilitated climate action planning in more than a dozen large cities and 500 counties, mobilizing over 130 million US dollars in public and private capital. In the light of this work and in the light of the Institute's mission, we are thrilled to join the Rockefeller Foundation and the partners of this event today. The release of the United Nations IPCC report this week and the call for code red by 14,000 scientists alerts the world once again with a clarion call to tackle the urgent and immediate causes and effects of climate change. As we know, India and South Asia are among the most vulnerable reason to adverse impacts of climate change. There are large coastal populations and diverse climatic zones with significant dependencies on monsoon-led agrarian economies and relatively inequitable development. The fact is that moving away from fossil fuels and increasing electrification by tapping into cleaner sectors is easier said than done, especially when it comes to population groups that are the hardest hit by climate change impacts. As we know, more than 300 million people lack access to a clean, continuous, high quality supply of electricity. And that leaves rural populations no choice except to turn to unsustainable fossil fuel sources. Additionally, immense opportunities in the rural economy remain unfulfilled due to lack of reliable clean energy supply. For example, less than 10% of India's farm produce is processed for further productive uses, compared to over 90% in developed economies, and that results in high amounts of food waste and loss. Apropos of this conversation today, energy access is an important nexus between equitable economic development and climate change mitigation. Distributed renewable energy, or in simpler terms, renewable energy-based mechanisms that are local, off-grid, and closer to source location, look like solutions that carry the additional benefit of the resulting technological advancements, which in turn could support a variety of revenue-generating applications, including food processing, textiles, cold chains, spices, and more. Distributed Renewable Energy, or DRE, looks like a very important tool to advance equitable climate action and sustainable development with multiple benefits across farming and other livelihoods, including enhanced access to reliable energy sources and reductions in environmental impacts. This session will lay the foundation for how energy access can foster greater shared prosperity. And I'm glad to say that's entirely in keeping with what I believe is our shared vision of energy for all, energy development, and energy for equitable climate actions. We have an eminent group of panelists gathered here contributing deep expertise on how we can advance energy democracy. We'll hear from them about local governance and leadership best practices, 
and the ways that distributed energy can transform villages into enterprising hubs. We'll hear about financing and markets and ways that enhanced access to capital and business models can boost micro enterprises and service demand, and in turn, address equitable development opportunities. I am so pleased today to introduce this esteemed panel of experts. You will hear from Dr. Dave Bajit Palit, Director of the Energy and Resources Institute. We'll hear from Mr. Jadeep Mukherjee, Head of Smart Power India, a Rockefeller Foundation-driven entity. We'll hear from Ms. Smita Rakshi, Director of Clean Energy and Climate Action at Social Alpha, and leaders in the distributed renewable energy space, Mr. Vijay Bhaskar, Managing Director at Hamara Grid. And now I'll hand it back to my colleague, Miga, to open this discussion. Thank you, Miga. Thank you. Uh, we missed out on Mr. Agnit Joshi, so uh, uh, just uh, that too. Um, thank you, uh, Ms. Ferris, for uh, uh, elaborating on the significance of DRE initiatives in India, especially in the rural regions where DRE can be the tool to meet climate ambition while uh, encouraging social equity and climate justice too. I would now like to put up another poll uh, on the current status of DRE uh, as we go uh, to the panelists uh, going forward. So the question is, uh, which sector according to you is currently uh, implementing a major majority of DRE initiatives in India? few minutes for this also. Yes, the guess is quite right. Um, so currently, uh, the household and the residential sector are using DRE systems most in India. And there's a lot of scope uh, to go uh, to the other uh, sectors also. And that's why we have this uh, great esteemed panel of experts where we will hear from uh, them on uh, how this uh, how this panel is uh, going to help us is it's going to envision a pathway towards developing a comprehensive DRE system across the country by investigating it from different perspectives. So to begin with, we have Ms. Smita Rakesh, uh, who leads the clean energy and climate action portfolios at Social Alpha. Social Alpha is an initiative to drive economic growth, social justice, and climate action through the power of entrepreneurship and market creating innovations. Smita has been deeply engaged with the global energy access ecosystem for more than 13 years. She will elaborate for us how villages can be a, can be transformed using DRE into enterprising hubs for social equity and throw some light on uh, private sector engagement. <clears throat> Going forward, we will have Mr. Jaydeep Mukherjee uh, who has a goal to accelerate electricity to unserved villages in India. As the CEO of Climate Power India, he leads the India-based work uh, for the smart power for rural uh, development uh, pro programs uh, with the Rockefeller. With uh, over 30 years of experience, Mr. Jaydeep showcases a strong track record in areas of innovation and expansion of new products uh, for developing markets of consumer goods and social enterprises. With his vision, we would learn how mini grids are a reliable option for in enhancing consumer experience with the uh, energy access in a clean and sustainable manner. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, then we have Mr. Jedi Patil, uh, a senior fellow and a director of the Rural uh, Energy and Livelihood Divisions in Terry and has about 24 years of experience working with projects related to renewable energy technologies and DRE. He has led projects in over 15 countries across India, South and Southeast Asia and sub suburban Africa with more than 70 uh, research publications a master and a master degree in physics uh, with a PhD in uh, energy policy. He has written widely on uh, energy access, DRE, rural electrification and energy gender power next poverty nexus. <clears throat> 
he would be able to give us a policy recommendation uh, to overcome barriers to electrify rural regions through DRE. Uh, then we have with us uh, Colonel Vijay Bhaskar, co-founder of uh, Hamara Grid in Calcutta, which specializes in supporting rural community access uh, to energy through mini grids again. Uh, Colonel Bhaskar has previously served as the MD for uh, Melinda Sustainable Ener Environment and CEO of the Korupandal Energy. With his leadership at Hamara Grid, currently with a spread of over 40 village-wide mini grids, establishing uh, 1,000 DRE-based rural development hubs in Northeast and helping the World Bank-funded National Electrification Plan in uh, Myanmar, we would like uh, <clears throat> Colonel Bhaskar to throw light on how DRE is a tool for so social equity in rural India. And uh, finally, uh, Mr. Radhvid Joshi, uh, the CEO of Clean, an industry accelerator representing 200 plus decentralized renewable energy organizations in India, committed to advance clean energy in integration for sustainable development in underserved communities. With Mr. Joshi's vision that uh, localized clean energy democratizes the power of choice for better healthcare, education, livelihood, and transforms communities to sustainable societies. We would want to understand from him how we uplift communities from poverty and combat climate change by leveraging DRE um, systems and products. So uh, my first question, uh, I, I would like to open uh, with uh, Ms. Rakesh. And uh, I would like to uh, hear from her um, and elaborate on how can DRE systems or products be used to transform villages into enterprising hubs for social equity. Also, since we have many uh, private players entering this market, are there any suggestions from your uh, experience on how villages that lack energy access invite private sector engagement? Thank you. Thanks, Mega, and thanks to the organizers for having me here. Um, since I have the you know privilege of opening this discussion, this very critical discussion, maybe I'll take the advantage of saying a few things, just putting across a few messages which we all know, but are very critical to be underlined to begin with. Uh, this this discussion is very, very um, important and rightly placed. Why? Because as critical as climate action is, you know, we all understand that for a country like India, in our context, we cannot, it's incomplete. Any climate action discussion is incomplete without the access part of it, where, and energy access at the core of it. But whether we are talking about talking of, uh, of livelihoods in agriculture, uh, access of energy for livelihoods, that, that whole uh, you know, periphery um, of, of the rural engagement, where, which needs to be at the core and has to be centralized uh, in India if we are talking climate action through clean energy. You know, the DRE sector has also been um, at a disadvantage of often being competed against the grid uh, and also, you know, uh, struggling with the uncertainties that come with this, this sort of being pitted against the grid kind of power supply, whereas it's actually only complementing to the grid. And that's been one of the uh, struggles in terms of business models and uh, risk uh, estimation with respect to uh, any kind of decentralized renewable energy solution, whether it's individual, standalone, or it's a mini grid solution. And I think with the increasing uh, electrification in India, it's all the more coming under the scanner and running a disadvantage. But at the same time, you know, even today, uh, if we honestly uh, look and introspect, DRE is not going to lose its relevance in any time soon. Uh, for various reasons. We, of course, know that there are geographies that are going to be inaccessible. Colonel Bhaskar is joining us from Nagaland. And it's not just about states which are far off and haven't had uh, you know, the, the kind of mainstream electrification uh, for years in the past, but also about pockets within states that often have been counted on the top of um, you know, the electrification list. right? So there's going to be inaccessibility in terms of geography given the nature, the topography of our country. There's going to be always a question of quality and reliability of power. And I'm sure um, you know, both uh, Colonel Bhaskar and Joydeep uh, and everybody, I think, on the panel can talk about how that has become one of the most important aspects of DRE. Uh, it's the reliability. It's the, it's the reliability in terms of time and quality that communities count upon, even if they have access to the grid electricity at the same time. 
Thirdly, it's also about the growing aspirations and demands and factoring that in, in terms of loading, load re, uh, ramping up, right? So the modular decentralized uh, energy's nature sort of helps factor in because the, you know, as soon as energy is introduced in an area which has otherwise been energy starved, needs and aspirations grow exponentially and rightly so. And therefore that needs to be factored in and that is where DRE has an edge over you know the the, the grid power and is is going to play a strong role in complementing uh, grid supply but finally when we speak of livelihoods um, it's also the case for productive applications um, you know grid electrification also has this challenge in many areas of being single phase so whether you talk about irrigation and farm based energy requirements or we talk about um, you know livelihoods which are non farm or whether we are talking about value added um, you know food processing kind of livelihood activities all of these sometimes require a power consumption which is not just single phase and therefore again the whole decentralized energy power uh, powered productive application load is something that becomes critical so we un we definitely understand and it's important for every player in the sector to understand that dre has a role to play and is here to stay how do we de-risk the business models in order to make sure it's been decades of india championing uh, you know at least a part of indian investment sector as well as um, you know the funding sector championing dre but it's still struggling in case of being investable and establishing business models that are less riskier and i think that's where we we we'll all have to play a very very critical role going forward as well I think um, you know a few things that I want to talk about, and we've recently, uh, I mean, a couple of years ago, launched a livelihoods and energy program, um, energy access and livelihoods program, with supported by the IKEA Foundation and in partnership with Selco Foundation, Sini, um, and Tata Trust. The idea is was to exactly look at. Um, you know, change the whole game around grant funding and look at livelihoods and energy access, the, the nexus between energy and livelihoods from the point of view of sustainable business models. So how do we use grant funding in order to create models which are actually uh, more enterprise driven and are sustainable and scalable on the ground with and, and, and gradually sort of wean off the grant support that they initially started with. And that's from that program, from Sustain Plus uh, Energy Foundation, the new initiative that we've started, we've had several learnings. But the one that I will highlight the most, and I cannot emphasize uh, any less, is that as actors in the sector, we've got to be honest in terms of the inputs that we put in and the outputs that we expect. You know, our, our, our theory of change or our expectations want impact in terms of inclusion, want impact in terms of gender, uh, want impact in terms of people's livelihoods and quality of lives improving. But if we go with very restricted business models, if we go with I, and, and it's nobody's fault, but if we design it in a way that, that the business model is looking at the so-called low-hanging fruits, it ends up, again, not uh, shaking the, the, the balance, right? So we enter a new geography, and let's understand that energy access is, is it, the introduction of energy into certain geographies is going to create a ripple effect. And if we are entering an area, a community where we all know that it's not a level playing field, if we are not going in with the intention of actual inclusion in terms of socioeconomic inclusion, gender inclusion, and, and making sure that we're looking at access for all, it's still going to be you know, uh, a long, long time when we, by the time we reach the, the sort of last person uh, that we support, right? Essentially, the problem is that our business models are still designed with the intent to achieve quicker results. And the, the impact uh, expectation is still trying to look at the bottom of the pyramid, the, a phrase that we are all very used to, uh, very, you know, uh, sort of, uh, it's a very prevalent phrase uh, in, in our sector. So I think there's, there's a, we all need to introspect in terms of what exactly are we feeding in to achieve that? Are we feeding in a risk appetite in terms of absorbing the kind of, um, you know, the kind of losses or the kind of risks and uncertainties that come with financial as well as otherwise, that come with entering a market that wasn't uh, existing. And I think uh, Megha mentioned in Social Alpha's introduction that we believe in market creating innovations, uh, because we understand that these are problem statements that haven't been addressed for the longest time. And therefore, for, a, for an entrepreneur or for a new technology or for a private sector player to enter uh, um, a market that doesn't exist. There is a need, but is latent and doesn't exist. It's going to be a, a you know a, a very uh, risk 
prone exercise and therefore unless it is supplemented by uh, players and actors from the sector it's not going to uh, you know be a single handed game and finally i just wanted to highlight three things which we believe are critical um, if uh, for from the community's perspective as well as from the perspective of private sectors entering um, you know uh, newer areas and and making sure that communities are integrated into the uh, dre landscape one is technology and innovation if we do not work on innovation that is embedded and factors in uh, user preferences we are actually losing the plot the second is of course finance like i said whether it's philanthropic capital or investment capital needs to have a higher risk appetite and needs to have a very clear theory of change and think of who do we want to impact and the third is the intent for design we have to know how we actually there to just uh, you know you know sort of uh, do our business or are we actually there to create the last mile impact and i'll, I'll probably pause with that but thank you very much for having me here thank you uh, so much uh, ms rakesh for sharing your experience and how dre comes with its co benefits and uh, establishing the role of inclusion and also suggesting ways to incorporate energy transition uh, needs for a, from the lens of a village so uh, with these fascinating facts i would now like to understand from mr mukherjee what is the importance of mini grids in the energy access space and also can you throw some light on how spi designs its mini grids program in rural communities <clears throat> all right uh, thank you megha and good evening everyone uh, before i dive into smart powers uh, dre led uh, mini grid program let me provide some context uh, about india's electricity services and and really frame the problem that we are trying to address through our dre initiatives over the last few decades india has uh, made significant strides uh, both on the generation side uh, including growth in renewable generations as well as in the electricity grid expansion uh, and connectivity thanks to the you know the accelerated program over the last 7 8 years uh, called the subhagya program the grid is omnipresent uh, now everywhere in the rural and nearly 100% household level connections have been achieved uh, and which we have witnessed uh, during the 5 6 years of our uh, ground work uh, so these are extremely laudable achievements india has more than adequate uh, generation capacity uh, currently 55 to 60% of the generation capacity is being used and there is a significant upside in terms of uh, you know as as electricity demand grows but despite these laudable achievements here is the paradox uh, diesel consumption and diesel usage for electricity continues to be extremely high in fact uh, i understand the figures are around between 35 to 45 billion liters of diesel usage uh, and and the low income states have a you know even higher proportion of uh, diesel usage the diesel generator manufacturers are predicting sales growth of 12.5% compounded annually so you have you know tremendous generation capacity you have grid everywhere and you also have this paradox of uh, you know extremely high diesel usage uh, continuing then comes another problem which is uh, the per capita electricity consumption which we all agree is a you know uh, a close proxy to measuring economic progress of a community or a country india's uh, per capita electricity consumption is one third of the world and indian rural electricity consumption is probably about one tenth of the world and no wonder uh, you know what you see there you can easily correlate uh, to the conditions and the economic conditions that are prevailing so this uh, brings us to you know this is uh, this is the paradox that we are looking at and uh, you know in in the, in the survey that uh, smart power india and niti aayog did across 10 states to survey a primary research to survey over 10000 customers households as well as commercial and uh, enterprise customers we found that uh, 40% of commercial and enterprise customers 
in uh, UP, Bihar, Jharkhand, Orissa, and northeastern states, accounting for 45% of the country's population, 40% have not connected to the grid and are primarily reliant on diesel. And of the remaining 60%, uh, only 10% have adequate electricity via the grid, which means more than 18 hours plus, you know, the World Bank framework for electricity consumption. And 60% to 80% have just the tier one uh, access, which is less than 12 hours and, uh, you know, two kilowatt uh, connectivity, uh, sometimes single phase. So you understand uh, why so much diesel uh, is being used. And this is, this is where our program actually comes in. And the Smart Power program, which has been uh, now, uh, now in its sixth year, has built uh, in partnership with about 10 private sector players, about 500 uh, mini grids, probably the largest portfolio of uh, renewable energy mini grids anywhere in the world, uh, and growing at the rate of 100, 200 in India uh, every year. So these mini grids uh, have served a key role in addressing, uh, you know, supplementing and bringing reliability, displacing diesel. But our program takes a holistic approach. We not only address the supply side, we look at how to expand enterprise activity. We look at how to bring in new enterprise development. Okay, it seems that we have lost uh, Mr. Uh, Mukherjee. Um, maybe we'll let him uh, finish. 25,000, more than, more, more than 25,000, excuse me. Is there... Sorry, we had lost you for a minute, but please Sorry. go ahead. More than 25,000 CNI customers are connected to the... Uh, are we connected now? Yes, yes, connected. Okay. Can you so more than twenty-five thousand? Yeah, more than twenty-five thousand CNI customers are now connected to the grid. The operation displays uh, or has eliminated uh, diesel to the extent of you know there's a elimination of twenty thousand tons of CO two per year from these uh, mini grids. So this is uh, you know some of the critical uh, you know this this explains why criticality of DRE solutions in the, you know, the rural economy of India, not only driving the economy, you know, creating uh, justice in terms of electricity, but also uh, the environmental uh, impact side. And in, in, in course of our work in the rural areas, we recognize another opportunity for expanding our DRE work when we found that the customers with five to 10 to 20 kilowatt individual requirement us cannot be serviced by the mini grids. And we are now about to launch uh, expansion to our programs to drive solar rooftop for commercial and enterprise customers in the rural. Because that market is constrained by, again, high risk access to finance and viable business model. So this is another uh, addition to our DRE program that we are about to uh, you know bring on the road uh, in the coming months and uh, again pointing to the fact that how critical the dre solutions are going to be not only in just energy transition but driving the economic uh, progress of our rural communities thank you thank you uh, this was great to know how uh, mini grids uh, bring into so many advantages to the uh, communities and uh, uh, really good plans that uh, uh, smart power india has uh, to get this economic development uh, uh, run going on and bring opportunity to increase the per capita consumption and a more sustainable lifestyle this makes me want to know how can we think of a bigger picture to advance energy democracy and i will look up to dr palit to explain to us if dre can be 
uh, the potential market instrument for India to meet its NDC and electrification goals. And if we can uh, have any complementary policy suggestions to advance uh, BRE initiatives. Too. Thank you, Megha. So, so let me uh, let me first uh, uh, congratulate all the stakeholders that we have achieved 100 gigawatt of, of uh, renewable energy power in India. And uh, many may not be knowing that we started with the DRE installation of a DRE system in 1981 in Masudpur village, which is now called Basant Kunj. Probably most of the many in the ministry may not also be knowing that. Uh, this one. So it's about 40 years of the DRE uh, system, though we have achieved 100 gigawatt primarily because of the centralized uh, renewable energy. But then it started with the DRE. And in fact, the electrification in India started in 1897 with uh, with a DRE solution in the form of a micro hydropower project in Darjeeling. Uh, this one. So, so just wanted to uh, build the context. And this one now. Let's uh, let's see what is happening now in India, as uh, rightly pointed out uh, by my previous speaker, uh, Mr. Mukherjee, that near universal electricity access has been achieved with uh, all villages claimed to have been electrified. Uh, there may be few hamlets here and there left uh, on this one, and all almost all households have been provided with the connection. And um, by end of 2020, uh, this one it was not in 19, 2019 actually. By end of 2020, this has been achieved. Uh, this one. Now, ensuring reliable and affordable electricity is an ongoing task, and this is being done by most of the. It's a, it's a, it's a state's task, not the central government's task, and the central government is working with the states to achieve this milestone by 2022. Uh, if not by 2022, maybe by 2023, it should be achieved. Now, given this context, definitely the we will ask to ourselves what is then the scope for DRD. Uh, this one, if we have achieved already achieved village electrification and household electrification, uh, electrification of public places and all other stuff, then what is the scope for DRD? Now, I think it's extremely important that we have to go beyond the narrative of reliable supply to positively push DRD solutions. This is something, the first thing that we need to do, and there are stakeholders here who are pushing DRD solutions. I think everybody has to think about that. We should stop this narrative of unreliable power supply. We started with the narrative of not all villages are electrified. Five years, five years back, we used to discuss on that. The villages got electrified. Then we started the narrative of not all households are electrified. All households are now electrified. Tomorrow, all the government will start, the discounts will start providing reliable power supply. What then you do? Don't you have a business model? One should ask the oneself this, this question. This, now, having said that, I certainly feel that DRD is most suitable, not just for individual homes, uh, given the uh, the new technologies that are evolving, and I'll come to that, but also for re-energizing livelihoods in the, uh, in the MSME sector, uh, with clean energy for processing, with control on the, the control of the system is on the user, this one. So they can know, they know when to use it and how best to use it, uh, this one. So this is extremely important. Why MSMEs? I am saying MSMEs are considered as the engines of growth, almost contributing 50% of India's total exports, employs more than 110 million people. But within the MSMEs, the, the first M is extremely important. The S and the last M is not that important. It's important, but they can themselves afford to have DRE or other solutions in their homes. So the micro enterprise, the home-based and cottage inter enterprise, which are almost 95% of the pie of the MSME pie, they don't have the capacity, they don't have the finance, affordable credit, uh, skills, competitiveness, and resulting in low income and low productivity. And because of that, they cannot afford to have a DRE systems on their own in their place. So what should we do? So, so there are agencies are required. This one is specialized agencies like my organization, Terry, is undertaking some task on that, uh, are required who can help these micro enterprises and home and cottage industries to assess the scope of DRE in this in their establishment, what type of solutions should be provided, what should be the, not just the technical model, but also the institutional model and the financial model. Now I'll give an example. Most of these enterprises are not registered. Now, if you're not registered, the, the, the scheduled bank will not give you loan, irrespective of whether the government has a scheme or has, has don't have a scheme. Now, 
what do you do then uh this one now if you go to the uh, to the other financing agency in the rural market i am just we are just doing a study and we found that the the financing rate ranges from 14% to 18%. So, so that is not an affordable finance or uh, this one, whereas the government finance might be around seven to 8%. But for that, you have to have a registration. You have to have the ITR, income tax return. You have to have uh, the SME registration. All these things are required. Now, these are the areas where I think just without directly going into putting up BRD systems, I think we have to also see that these are the other associated things which needs to be addressed first and they should be brought into a collective. We don't have a collective of or association or in the clusters who are empowered, who can take decisions, who are aware about the technologies. Uh, this one, so we are not working with them. So these are the areas we need to start working with them so that we can uh, we can push the DRD systems in, 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 in the different micro enterprise clusters. We did a study with, with support from Shakti Foundation last year, and this year we are doing with IKEA Foundation, where it's found that Many of these clusters has huge potential for implementing DRD systems. Their, their load requirement is something like, uh, say, from 50 watt, 50 watt to maybe one kilowatt or two kilowatt, uh, which are extremely uh, this one with the DRD systems can be an extremely useful for for at that range. You don't need uh, because DRDs are in kilowatt, and and this requirement in these micro enterprises are also in kilowatt. So it, it's a, it's a clearly matching the the load with the demand. Both are matching the supply and the demand are matching. So, but then you need to have built on the associated uh, things that are extremely important. This is number one. Number two for the uh, now, what do you do to achieve to achieve that? So, I I give a 4D type of solution for spe specifically focusing on the micro enterprise sector. Uh, so, before I do that, now in in most of these enterprise and and in the in the rural areas, they call what they say is that for them, whether it is DRD or the grid supply, it doesn't matter to them. Now, it's a, what they call it equivalent electricity. That means we talk about reliability, but at the same time, we don't talk about adequacy of electricity. So so we did, so, so we have undertaken some surveys in the village and we found that both are equally important. So can you provide the adequate electricity that can meet your demand? And at the same time, also provide reliable and affordable electricity. So all three are, I think, extremely important and equally important. Now, having said that, I propose a 4D type of solution that what we are implementing at the field is that first you have to have discussion with this, your stakeholder, whether it is micro enterprise or the cottage industries or, or the households. Then you have to develop the necessary techno institutional models. Just alone technical model is not going to serve the purpose because institutions are extremely important. And if we have to develop local institutions who can create the ecosystems in the villages or in the rural areas to provide the necessary sale and service and handholding support to these enterprises or the consumers, then you demonstrate the technology. Now we are finding it difficult because the funding agency is not providing us support for hardware. Now, how do I demonstrate a technology? Now we have prospective consumer in the MSME sector or micro enterprise sector, but I cannot demonstrate a technology which might cost me as a lakh or two lakhs, uh, this one no? so that I can convince the bank, the bank is ready to finance, but only after seeing the demonstration. The user is ready to take the technology, but only after seeing the demonstration. So how do I do that? So this is an area where I think not, we need to start working. Uh, this one, the funding agency also need to be uh, cognizant of this requirement and start also fund demonstration and then of course finally the dissemination of the solutions and if you do this 4d the fifth you will automatically come that's the dividend you will automatically get the dividend from 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 this 4d so 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 i think this could be the roadmap for the household sector i i can visualize a solution at which i have written uh, probably next week it will it will be published uh this one no that I visualize a solution where you, where in India we are going to with advent of technology and uh, what you call it, uh, this one, Internet of Things and other. So you have microgrids, you have actually uh, different models like peer to peer models, the consumer based uh, models, the, uh, this, uh, this one of the individual systems at the household. Mr. Mukherjee rightly mentioned about in villages if there are consumers who need to have one kilowatt two kilowatt systems maybe more than that at the <clears throat> solar packs in their house 
these are all interconnected with the microgrid the type of microgrid that mr mukherjee is implementing under uh, the spi is implementing and these are interconnected with them with modern technology you can actually each one can speak with the other uh, uh this one and these microgrids are then connected with the main grid uh, this one so the main grid actually becoming from a distribution grid to a sub transmission grid this one no? and with technology you can actually there can also be trading between the different partners so i think whether it is 5 years or 10 years down the line i don't know but definitely this is a this is something that the electricity market or the electricity system is going to see in future uh, whether it is in india or in other places definitely it's going to happen and that would truly empower the consumers because they would then take a decision on how much electricity to use for what purpose i should use it and at what time i should use it and accordingly the tariff would be designed and and that would be the day when we can really see uh, tell that yes we have provided universal electricity access and consumers are taking the decision thank you thank you this is wonderful thank you for looping in everything for us so wonderfully um, i would now request uh, mr uh, colonel bhaskar to comment on the consolidation of strength in the market uh, for the to boost infrastructure finance and market linkages. Uh, over to you, Ms. Uh, Dr. Colonel Vasquez. Uh, Vijay, you're on mute. Sorry, sorry about that. I was saying, uh, I can see Mega looking a little worried about time, so I'm going to make it really quick. And uh, yeah, I just cover cover four or five uh, very important aspects. Most of the stuff has been covered by the previous speakers. I think we are all aware of uh, what's happening over there. I'll just cover scale, uh, the initial buy-in, uh, which Devadi talked about, policy, finance, uh, technical uh, innovation, uh, sophistication, uh, training skills, and uh, impact. So I'll be quick about it. Uh, so the minimum scale required for mini grids. I'm talking about mini grid context now in the DRE space. Uh, minimum required to make it viable, sustainable uh, is, is about 50 to 100 mini grids, depending on what level of what kind of sustainability you want to achieve. And it has to be done in a very compact geography. So scale is required to keep capex down. Uh, compact geography is required to keep uh, overheads costs down. So you can you can imagine if somebody wants to get into the mini grid space. 50 to 100 mini grids would translate to almost like five to ten million dollars investment. You should be ready to come in with that. And without that, it's really difficult for the person to for the developer to really sustain over a period of time. Second, uh, Devaji touched upon it. Others have also touched upon it. It's initial buy-in, extremely important. So we need to engage with the stakeholders, engage with the communities that we are going to serve, uh, get them to understand what really the model is, negotiate the tariff that's going to work for them and for you, and try and see how this entire thing is going to be not just a pure energy service model, but also something that's going to help them uh, in livelihoods and a lot of other things. So unless economic development happens, uh, really the mini grid model is not, not going to be sustainable. Uh, the, the other is about policy. We, we make a lot, talk a lot about policy, but uh, not having a, uh, having a government policy in a state is sometimes quite an okay thing to get started with. Uh, what is the policy going to tell you? It's going to tell you that here, uh, you can come into my state and build mini grids. We recognize that, which is fine. We don't really need them to say that because the Electricity, Electricity Act anyway allows you to, after, after permission of the village community, the village council or the Gram Sabha to set up a mini grid. So you don't really need the state to give, give you a policy on that. And then there are today, uh, or as, as somebody brought out, almost and every village is connected connected to the main grid. And therefore, that stuff that we worried about that, okay, what if the grid comes is, is no longer there. And as somebody said, you need to build a business model around the grid being there and the unreliable and a poor quality grid uh, being there. So, uh, and, and we really don't have to worry about the policy being there because when we went into Jharkhand, uh, there was no policy. There's something happening over there now. Uh, they are trying to put together a policy, but there was always support from the government. Uh, whenever you wanted on solutions, especially to do with livelihoods, uh, cold chains and agriculture. We're now working in Nagaland. The government there is, there's no policy over there, but the government is absolutely welcoming and says that they are going to sort of help us, uh, you know, uh, set up DRE solutions in the state. 
but where really the policy matters and most of the policy the state policies do not address uh, is the fact that the other infrastructure that is there in the villages which is around around health uh, primary health centers schools uh, street lights uh, all other infrastructure that is there which is, is is not not covered under the policy so you may set up they allow you to set up a mini grid but then what happens to all the other stuff because they are all dependent on other other kind of system which is unreliable but now the nagaland government is planning to work to help us to integrate this entire thing into an integrated model which is what i think the policy should address next is about finance now there is uh, as we said the, the dre sector is not viable as a pure energy service provider model it has to it has this energy has to contribute towards the economic development of the village it has to uh, encourage livelihoods it has to encourage productive loads and there is a different kind of an intervention to required for for you to generate demand and sustain it uh, going forward and therefore this soft part of the project has to be on grants and therefore there has to be a blended finance that has to come in in terms of grants debt and equity and therefore the organization structure that we have in terms of just a private limited company doing it is not going to work you will need a hybrid model a for profit working with a non for not not for profit which can receive this uh, funds for the softer parts of the project next is technological sophistication and innovation the operational expenditure can only be kept down if you have a very sophisticated system to monitor data acquisition uh, data monitoring data analytics and link it with with the user the end end part of it which is the smart meters uh, and and then these both should be able to talk to each other for you to really take decision how to grow demand so unless that can happen uh, the operational costs are going to be extremely high the last part is as you grow beyond 30 40 grids the, there's a huge pressure on 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 you know human resource skill building and this is something that we need to address because at the number of moving parts that that become very huge Uh, because you need to develop social skills for your people you need to develop uh, you know the technical skills and this has to go hand in hand with micro enterprise building and therefore that same person you can't have different specialists roaming around over there the operation costs overheads are going to be extremely high and uh, the, the skill development is going to be a very important part last and not the least unless you have an independent impact assessment of what of the work that you are doing the stakeholders in terms of whether it's the government the investors Uh, the, the grant makers and you yourself are not going to understand what exactly is happening over there, and therefore, right at the outset, an impact assessment, uh, you know, uh, component has got to be built into this. Thank you so much, Mega. Keeping that uh, so crisp, and uh, for giving us these eye-opening uh, uh, reality checks of what's happening on the ground. Uh, with this, I would want uh, to invite uh, Dr. Jo, uh, Mr. Joshi. Uh, to elaborate on how uh, we how dre products can help on ground users to leverage their socio economic status and uh, you support i mean uh, because you support so many dre players uh, can you also throw some light on you know the policy recommendations to strengthen the ecosystem and uh, keeping in mind climate justice um, so yes yeah, okay. so you... thanks mega and it's wonderful to hear everybody uh, before me i think they have covered a lot of different segments under dre and its journey up till now over here uh, but like you said i think i would like to mix climate uh, economics and social social part together because that's where uh, you know energy plays a very critical role and that's why at clean we believe that uh, the amount of work that has been done by our members or any dre practitioner out there uh, sort of innovate democratizes the choice uh, the choice is not about democratizing whether i have access to energy or not whether it is good quality or not whether uh, you know it is sufficient or not i think it creates a choice for an individual a family an enterprise or any other institution to really make a choice on how they want to grow using this uh, you know demand for energy and that is something that we have seen that decentralized renewable energy really provides because it can be easily customized to it Uh, we have seen some very good examples on field by work done by mini grid players micro grid players stand alone players uh, solar or any other different dre technology where simple economic benefit that comes to the uh, you know end user is one of course extended hours of business uh, but over the last few years we have also seen that dre has also extended the overall footprint of that particular enterprise or 
uh, ability for those enterprises or even individuals to really grow in the socio-economic culture. Take an example of uh, another uh, work that one of our members has done on the solar dryers, where installing a solar dryer has uh, not just increased uh, the operating hours for, their, uh, for them to dry, let's say, cardamom or pineapple or even meat, uh, but that has given them the ability to increase their income to about, you know, by about 7,000 per month, uh, bring down the entire ROI for, uh, you know, getting financing for such equipments to as down as, you know, one or two years compared to, you know, what it would have been earlier up to about three to four years. And that is where we are seeing, uh, you know, uh, you know, strong change on the ground when, it, when we look at DRE, social and economic part of it. Uh, another segment in socioeconomics which we don't really look very keenly uh, is also the gender equity equity part of it. And we have seen that DRE has played a significant role even there. Uh, so uh, we have seen again uh, several examples right from you know blacksmith uh, to you know potteries to you know uh, sewing machines and uh, spinning and reeling machines where uh, because of the burden or I would say the drudgery that was involved uh, previously, uh, a DRE solution or adapted solution, uh, you know, removes that treasury and sort of allows both uh, genders to play equally in terms of, you know, creating better economic opportunities for themselves and sort of grow in that society. So again, I come back to the whole thought about, you know, that, you know, DRE, I agree, uh, you know, there is grid uh, and, you know, what role will DRE play? DRE will play this role of, you know, creating new options and opportunities like we have, uh, fortunately, sitting in large cities. Uh, today, uh, during this pandemic, we all uh, are sitting in good cities and we have an option of, you know, A hospital or B hospital uh, where we want to go. But when you think about rural communities, they have to think about number of kilometers uh, afar that, you know, a rural hospital probably would have energy uh, at that given point uh, in a more qualitative aspect as well. And the kind of facilities that the rural healthcare clinic can afford because of that access to energy or the kind of infrastructure that they can afford uh, compared to uh, the energy requirements that they have. So, uh, you know, that is where I believe, uh, you know, there is a strong uh, role that, you know, clean energy can play, uh, you know, is playing and sort of is where it can expand. Uh, I'll touch upon policy a little bit later, uh, you know, at the maybe the last minute of it. Uh, but when I, when I think about, you know, looking at how climate plays uh, or DRE plays a big role in climate action, a large part of DRE examples we have been seeing is in the, the central, the plains of India, uh, if I have to say. But the moment you look at coastal uh, regions, the moment you look at the uh, the mountain terrains or the hilly terrains, where climate uh, impact is really creating a lot more damage, uh, in a way, I believe climate justice can be reduced by introducing, uh, you know, more strongly DRE solutions. Uh, why should just a coastal community or a hilly terrain, you know, lose their livelihoods, lose lose their, uh, you know, loved ones, their livestock, uh, their entire, uh, you know, life quality, uh, because uh, you know climate change is affecting a larger wor world. Uh, and not really getting affected similarly in urban areas like where we are. So I think climate justice, you know, DRE can play a role by introducing DRE solutions, uh, you know, in those areas. Uh, so be it for, uh, I think even in the previous panel, we saw how, uh, you know, small landholders can really use DRE to, you know, focus on uh, creating uh, better yield and better output and better income and better economic and social uh, value for themselves. Uh, similarly, if I think about, uh, you know, uh, the overall quality of life as well, uh, where, uh, you know, even something as basic as look, heating systems, uh, demand for that is going to grow, uh, you know, as we see the effects of climate change increase, either it will be a rapid uh, or, you know, increased in lower temperatures or, you know, really, you know, uh, you know, harsh summers. And that is where you will see more and more demand for energy really come through where, you know, DRE again can play a role in a very decentralized uh, manner. Uh, Keeping an eye on the time, uh, a quick, you know, four points for what we believe that policy can bring a change. Up till now, policy uh, has been focused on, you know, Ministry of Power or MNRE with the focus point of, you know, getting recognition for DRE. But I think there is high time that, you know, it has to move beyond energy ministries or, you know, other departments. We need to make sure that, you know, uh, you know, Ministry of Rural Development, uh, you know, healthcare, agriculture, textile, everybody, MOEFCC need to recognize the potential uh, that you know dre brings onto the table uh, and both long term uh, you know potential and short term potential i think the other big uh, move or uh, activity that clean is also involved along with its partners and members is to sort of also narrow down that conversation from state level engagement of its energy departments or srlms to at the district or even the panchayat level to make sure that you know whatever plans they are do, they are developing whatever growth uh, uh, you know activities they are planning DRE becomes a crucial aspect of that decision making. 
a crucial aspect of budget uh, you know allocation now those kind of policy initiatives will also bring confidence for financial institutions donors uh, csr as well uh, to really come and uh, invest and participate in it uh, and that is where i also come back to one small point about you know finance how you know finance needs to be completely rethought through re- re- restructured so that it can understand that risk is not just about roi and uh, you know repayments there is a huge risk behind you know that impact that climate change is going to create on many of these vulnerable communities which also need to be factored when they look at the overall risk and what dre sort of brings onto the table to mitigate those risks so with with that i think uh, that's a quick snapshot and run through of you know what what at clean we believe in and what we have been looking at when we think about democratizing energy when we think about climate socio and economic aspects of it i i hope that, that's helpful that that's great um we have almost come to the end and uh, i was just thinking if anybody has any parting comments uh we do have couple of questions coming in about uh, you know the problem of barriers against energy storage and how can we have effective gender based equality uh, so any thoughts on uh, any of these points or any parting comments from anyone uh, beyond uh, that uh, jedi mr patel mr bhaskar uh, adwit or uh, ms rakesh i could quickly talk about the uh, the gender inclusion part maybe uh, you know i think uh, you know it's 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 complex gender is one of the most complex areas but i think uh, like i was saying uh, the whole integrating gender and having a clear understanding of what the barriers are uh, we've seen projects where uh, it 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 has helped break the gender barrier and we've seen projects where it's only sort of intensified the gap and therefore being aware of what the uh, community's barriers in terms of gender are and trying to intervene in a way that you're not sort of ending in a conflict situation but you're actually trying to uh, plug those gaps also investing in the entire value chain with respect to gender and not just uh, you know uh, women as customers that's great thank you so much uh, does anyone else want to say anything yeah let me let me just put forward about the uh, question on the organized market perspective for dre uh, this one i think i think uh, before we start the thinking about the organized market perspective definitely it is much more organized now than 10 years back now we have clean uh, advait is here uh, who are representing the different dre uh, stakeholders across the value chain so it is getting organized but what is two things uh, as, as somebody who has been working in the dre sector for more for almost 24 years now uh, this one i'd like to put forward two things one is that we are very emotional this one and i think all dre stakeholders or renewable energy stakeholders are emotional instead of being emotional we have to be practical now when we say we are practical we have to be practical we should not compare the best anecdotal case of dre with the worst anecdotal case of grid now we need to do empirical surveys of dre installation which is which is there is no empirical survey of dre installations ever done in india except some of the evaluation studies of projects and programs that uh, stakeholders might have done now if we do a cross country empirical assessment of the dre installation and try to learn lessons not to find out faults but try to learn lessons from them what has worked what has not worked uh, this one without comparing it with the grid probably we can probably we can uh, this would be a great way forward to understand what can make dre work in a situation where the grid i am presuming is the is giving completely reliable 24 by 7 electricity still we have to work there because dre there is there is a renewable energy element there is a empowerment element there is a democratization element uh this one and because of all these reasons that we have to make the dre work irrespective whether the grid is working or not working now how do we do that and we can only do that when we stop comparing it with the grid so 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 my phd thesis was, was on the towards convergence of grid and 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 dre solution for sustainable rural electrification so we have to see how both can coexist in the best form taking advantage of each of this uh, this one a solution uh, this one so so irrespective of whether the whether you the 24 by 7 reliable electricity or not wherever you can put up dre solutions we should try to put up dre solutions 
uh, this one. And and if it is not possible, for example, in large industries, then definitely the grid is a solution, or a large solar power plant is a solution. So we have to think in that way instead of compare. Thanks. All right. Uh, thank you. I will now uh, have to. Uh, we will now have to leave this platform as we don't have much time. Uh, we, uh, lastly, I would. Uh, this is very encouraging to have leaders uh, who can make us feel that to, tomorrow India would be a place where there'll be inaccess where inaccessible energy will uh, you know not be a problem really. Uh, I would finally like to thank our patient listeners, our audience, and all our speakers. Uh, um, and our co-hosts and partners, uh, Sarang, Sanat, Abhinav, uh, Priyank, and special thanks to uh, Mani and our ISE team um, who has uh, helped us, uh, who, have, who has helped and uh, done all last minute changes and been up to this. Thank you so much. Uh, this was a great session. Uh, we will end now. Thank you. <laughs>